Welcome back to the Block Fuel Podcast. We are here today with Rob Haddock over at Dragonfly, which is a VC Dragonfly. You guys are a number of different things. So why don't we kick things off, actually, if you want to just give a, a quick personal background and then share very high level about Dragonfly. We'll ask some more detailed questions as we go in, but welcome to the Block Fuel Podcast, Rob. Cool. And thanks for having me. And I would say at our core, we are a VC. We, you know, we've done a lot of things throughout our time. But that is our main mandate from our LPs. We're about two and a half billion dollars under management. We've been around since 2017, so I guess in this space that makes you kind of OGs. Yeah. It's it's not a not a space that's been around that long. And I guess now that's seven years ago, so longer era than I realized. But we're super global. So I think one of the things that really sets us apart is we do have roots in Asia. We have roots in the U.S. We about half the investment teams in Asia. We do all of our investing with kind of a global outlook in mind. So cool. whether it's you know investing in Western protocols or companies or whether it's investing in other geographies, it's always around how does crypto affect the global ecosystem? How does crypto affect global economies? And not around, I want this like Google engineer to do this thing that in the US that doesn't have an effect on uh, people elsewhere. So listen, I think it's in our DNA and we've been doing it since the beginning. We... We don't want to be short-term thinkers. So, you know, the current regulatory environment in the U.S. is not going to be the regulatory environment in the U.S. possibly within the year and not the regulatory environment in the U.S. in five years. And what we do is we think about what is the world going to look like five, six, seven, eight, ten years in the future, not what's going to look like six years in, in, in the future. So it's not really around the regulatory piece. But what it is around is the crypto first, the ethos is that in open source software more broadly is that, hey, listen, you can pick up. You can be a Stanford kid anywhere in the world or a Harvard kid in the world or a self-taught engineer anywhere in the world. You can pick up a laptop and you can go, you can figure out how to code and you can go launch your own protocol, right? And what we've seen is a lot of innovation in crypto is happening outside of the traditional means of, you know, having been traditionally trained and having gone through, you know, working at a fang or, or something like that. And, and so we believe that there's a lot of opportunity globally. And we believe that, you know, the ethos of permissionless, trustless blockchains in internet money is one that affects economies globally. And so that's how we think that you have to view the world to be able to appropriately invest and understand where the risk is coming from and understand the different user bases, et cetera. I mean, you see it right now with, if you think about crypto just trading from a speculation perspective, the, the, the reason the Asian exchanges have the most volume, right? And by you know an order of magnitude, because not just because they're like less regulated, but because that's where the, the people that are based that in mass want to trade this thing right now. Yeah. And this is, we also see it in, you know, other verticals like gaming or uh, a lot of, you know, different types of consumer type of applications stepping came out of the Asia, et cetera. So we, we believe it's like core to how you have to think about crypto if you're going to be the best investor. I guess going to the investment side, you, you mentioned you started in 2017, I guess like personally, like coming from like private equity in New York, the hub of finance, like what was like personal crypto journey and like how, what was the moment you were like, all right, I'm going to commit to this. And like, it's like this week, it's fine because like Larry Fink says like crypto is okay. And like, you know, ETFs are approved, but two weeks ago, three weeks ago, it's kind of like faux pas in some you know traditional finance circles to commit to that as an asset class. So like, you know, what was the beginning? And then like, you know, what was that light bulb moment? You're like, all right, I'm diving in. Yeah, so uh, I found crypto and Bitcoin in 2013. I was uh, like an analyst at Goldman. I was mostly advising and doing like fintech M&A and, you know, being, you know, very fascinated with, you know, money and payments and things like that. I found Bitcoin to be just, you know, a really interesting concept at the time. I would say, so I bought my first Bitcoin then. It was interesting. It was something I talked about with you know other people in the city, et cetera. But I don't know if the light bulb really clicked for me until, you know, call it 2016, 2017, when you know, Ethereum happened, the ICO happened, and, and people started talking about smart contracts. And you started, you know, not right then, but very soon afterwards, thinking about, you know, the start of uh uh, on-chain applications that could reinvent or rethink the way that we do financial services. And that conversation is where I started to go, oh, like there's something here that is like very, very interesting. At the time I was still, you know, I think if I, if I called my mom and I was like, I'm, I'm leaving my job at this big bank or this, this private equity firm to go and do crypto full time, it would have been a, a tough conversation. And 
And I continued to kind of you know, do it on the side, go to meetups, read, et cetera, while I was you know, working full time in a traditional finance job and, 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 you know, looking at my chops as an investor, but they, it was come around to 2020 or so and DeFi summer is starting to happen. And I'm talking to, you know, big corporates at the time. I'm, I'm talking to Visa and MasterCard and PayPal and Franklin Templeton. I remember having early conversations with Jenny Johnson before they, Franklin Templeton put that money market fund on mm. Stellar and, you know, just kind of the ideation that was happening in these large corporates, the ideation that was happening in in DeFi started to really make me think, oh, this is like, this is something I should be making a career. This is something that is, you know, not just, you know, trading, not something something I should be doing on the side, but I have to get all the way in. Like, this is a revolution. And that's really what DeFi Summer did for me. And when I started going, okay, well, you know, this is something I'm going to do on the side to this is going to be my job. So I, I started kind of doing a little bit of consulting work at the time was talking to a lot of different hedge funds and, and large corporates, like I mentioned, and ended up going to, you know, kind of dipping my toe, I guess, if, if, into going to a crypto only role, but at a big TradFi hedge fund, which was called Golden Tree Asset Management, about 50 billion of AUM, primarily credit fund. And, you know, helping build out the capabilities for them when they just started thinking about it, you know, late 20 into 21. And, you know, kind of at that wave of when it became like, you know, very acceptable for anyone at a big hedge fund to like spend time in crypto. You know, looking back, obviously it was, there's a lot of froth and there's a lot of bad habits oh. that, you know, were, 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 were being formed at the time. But I realized as I was doing that full time and just how, how much innovation I saw so quickly, how much fun I was having, but being able to be coupled with kind of my training as, you know, both in banking and private equity to, to look, th- look at, you know, protocols and applications and, you know, businesses in some cases too, through that lens, but understand like the innovation that was happening in the tech was, you know, somewhat different than some of the way the investing had been done in, in the space previously. And I knew that I wanted to kind of deepen uh, my, my, my foothold in the space. And so it was around, you know, early 22 I, and in 21, I co-invested with the Dragonfly while I was at Golden Tree and in, in, hmm. in some things. And I've gotten to know Hasib a little bit. And, you know, we, we started getting to talk and, and he said, listen, like we're, you know, we'd love to have someone with your kind of background to come on and, and kind of round out the team. And I just, you know, jumped at the chance. So I was just, you know, excited to go that much deeper into crypto and, and mm-hmm. kind of provide my lens to a firm that is, you know, very research driven, very crypto native, and, you know, has had a real engineering focus for, for a long time. So I guess it- this dichotomy between you know traditional finance now coming over, I mean, I don't know if, it, if it's such a gap, right? I I see a world in which fintech, you know, and crypto, everything going to become one, you know, probably you know a couple of years down the line. The speed of things is so much different as we discussed, you know, within the crypto world. So like thinking of like how do you put your stake in the ground, you know, maybe with fintechs it's easier. You kind of have a solution, you find the the revenue streams, and it's like okay, that makes sense. Now for crypto, you have, you know, RWAs, DPIN, DeFi, there's all these different like flavors of the month of what's hot right now. So how, how do you guys think about that? Just very high level of before you invest in a company, are you guys looking at these thematics and really thinking about, you mentioned like five, 10 years down the road, is that similarly how you're kind of looking at, at some of these different areas, I guess, as well? Yeah. So I, I would say, and, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to speak for me personally and not the rest of the team here, but I, I think this is how we try to do it, you know, broadly as a, as a firm. But we, we don't, we don't see themes and say, Hey, we need, you know, to go invest in this theme, right? Mm-hmm. Just because it's, you know, popular on Twitter, or it's popular, you know, in the group chats or whatever. We try to be very like, you know, kind of fundamental in the way we think, think about things from first principles. And we try to look for one founders who think that way and are, you know, very focused on building sustainable protocols, sustainable businesses, sustainable applications that will, you know, disrupt industry uh, and that will do that for a long period of time. And we try to look for those, you know, businesses and protocols that are doing that, that are a zero to one type invention, right? Like not a incremental, you know, I, I'm sure you guys remember during 21, there's like, I, I don't know, you, you name your like, you know, specific protocol and like the next one popped up on next layer one or next layer two or next layer three. And these things were getting crazy valuations and everybody was putting money into them. Mm-hmm. And that type of like incremental type of, of, of launching of tokens, et cetera, is not like, it's just not interesting, right? What we want to do is, is we believe in a world in which like blockchain and crypto 
kind of reinvent financial services, reinvent payments, re- reinvent the way we you know coordinate trust. And so that's that's kind of the core of how we how we look at things. And so when I look at it across like you know all these different themes, it, it's not about there being a theme. It's about there being you know something in which we think blockchains and crypto are able to disrupt the way those things are done elsewhere, right? And so I think there are times where it's easy to go and look and say, I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't have like, you know, exposure to this like vertical and this vertical has like gone up 50 times and I'm yeah. like, crap, like, like, was I, was I like, am I an idiot, right? Like, you know, then they, my LPs pay me to like make money. And I think over time we've tended to be more right than wrong, right? And that, that's allowed us to continue to get that trust from our LPs. But there's no doubt that that crypto Twitter, at least in the way of which price action happens, can be very thematic at times. Mm-hmm. So I, I would say, you know, you know, you mentioned a couple like RWAs, DPIN, DeFi, et cetera. DeFi, you know, as we is something we've been, you know, extraordinarily deep in for a long time. And as you can, you know, hear from my earlier kind of talk about 2020 and, and whatnot, you know, something that we're we're very interested in. We've done some stuff in DPIN, maybe a little bit in RWA. I think you know the, we're still wait and see. I, I think the probably the, the the most obvious one where we haven't done a ton is gaming for a while. With that market is it's just really really competitive and really hard to be successful at without narrowing your funnel that it has to be crypto native and it has to be on chain in some way. We've done a few deals there where we think that you know the the teams are not necessarily trying to do that, but we. You know, we're open to every vertical, we're open to every chain, we're open to every region, but but we're really focused on, you know, what do we think is going to be disrupted and, and where the innovation is going to be, not, you know, what is crypto Twitter telling me is going to pump next. And then w- one more follow up and then I'll let you go, Jody. But in, in terms of, I'm just curious, because you're always hearing about like, there was just so much money being pumped in the economy during 2020 where you could close your eyes, throw a dart and, and you'd look like a genius, right? I ha- have another podcast that that happened on where I was, you know, this this evil genius of a stockbroker. Now, is there money still on the sideline? I hear different, you know, buckets of, of VCs saying that they still have a ton of money on the sideline. They're, they're seeing with rates and how everything's moving. But like, what would you say, just not necessarily for Dragonfly, but what are you hearing amongst your VC friends? Are they kind of waiting for some of this regulation to get clarified? Or have you seen, and we're going to get into that next here with the ETF approval, but like, has has that shifted anything in the past week or so? Yeah. So, I, I mean, if you look at the data that came out, and I tweeted something about this a couple of days ago, some, some data from Fortune. I, it was actually from PitchBook, but the... If you look at the data that's been announced and what PitchBook's been able to, to pull, Q4 still looks really bad, right? It looks really bad in terms of historical exits. It looks really bad in terms of, you know, investments that are being made in crypto and venture more broadly. It looks bad in terms of, of the amount of deals getting done, not just the amount of capital deployed getting done or getting capital getting deployed. If I think about what's actually happening on the ground and, and this type of data is really delayed because, you know, for instance, we've done deals back in, in, in the spring that, you know, haven't publicly announced yet that nobody knows about. And, and so that data ends up being so delayed that usually it's a few uh, quarters kind of behind. And I actually think looking around, at least for like seed, series A, pre-seed, that the market for VC broadly and crypto VC probably bottomed in Q2 in around during the summer. And I think we're kind of on the, so this is the exit piece specifically. You can see that we're over the last decade, we're, we're historically low in terms of, in terms of exits in VC. But yeah, I, listen, I think now, <laughs> today, yeah, it's my, uh, the, the, I was uh, trying to bring it up. Yeah. I've, I've never actually listen, done that know, in but, real time before. So, but, but you know, pump my Twitter. So, you know, get the, the follower count up. There so, you go. <laughs> uh, no, but no, listen, I, I think the pipeline today is pretty strong. We're starting to see a lot more deals get done. We're starting to see all the entrepreneurs that are, you know, kind of coming to us and coming to the other funds. They are, you know, I think of better and, you know, of, of greater value or not value, but, you know, kind of better, greater pedigree and, and, mm-hmm. and more talented than what we were seeing trying to raise and, you know, call it, you know, Q2. And I, I do think that we're on this upswing, but there is still a lot of capital on the sideline. So we're probably in the beginning of what I expect to be, you know, both a lot of capital allocation going into, you know, liquid crypto, but also venture crypto again. And I think, you know, throughout this year, you'll, It'll start to look uh, a, l- a little bit crazy. 
That said, on the later stages, so call it like Series B plus, it still feels pretty dead. And mm. people just are trying to figure out like where, you know, what has product market fit, what is sustainable, like, you know, can't, can't what am I allowed to pay or supposed to pay for this thing that might have raised before and mm. an extraordinarily high multiple or FDB or whatever. And so that's a place where, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic because I think there's still a lot of, you know, places where I can find value and we can put money to work at, you know, before what, while well, seed valuations are, 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 are continuing to rise. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to be aggressive there if, if and when we can be. Yeah. It seems like you guys too have like, you know, even starting like early last year when a lot of things were dead, you guys kind of rolled in and like had some stuff going in like February, March, May, you know, these different investments. You know, looking at one that, you know, you obviously spoke with uh, on a podcast, uh, Monad, which we think is, is you know, one of the more like anticipated projects in 2024 to like be rolling out and getting into a test net and, and seeing kind of like what the parallelized DDM, you know, looks like and, and bringing that forth. Like, could you talk a little bit about like, you know, at a high level, you know, th they have to obviously like be making some noise internally at Dragonfly, like. What, what attracted your team to, to Monad, how they stood out versus like all these other, you know, L2s or, you know, alternative L1 solutions and uh, you know, anything you can share on that front. Yeah. So there's only so much I can share right now, but I, I would say this and we're extremely excited about, about them and about Keone and, and, and the team and, and what they're doing there. We, we've long felt that, and I think a lot of people have, so, you know, we're not unique in this, but that scaling is one of the biggest issues in Ethereum and in the DBM ecosystem to, you know, to build applications that do the disruption that I talked about earlier, right? And so scaling is a place in which we've, in scaling solutions, whether it's alternative layer ones, layer twos, et cetera, is a place where we've invested in as kind of a theme for a number of years now. And, you know, when we started talking to the team and, and the first investment was actually done before I joined Dragonfly, but when we started talking to the team, you know, I think we felt pretty strongly that, you know, unshackling consensus from execution and being able to do the execution asynchronously is a, is a solution which makes a lot of sense, which should have better latency, which should have and much better latency and should have, you know, the kind of this, you know, full EVM equivalence with that latency that we think is, is pretty unique. And we feel pretty strongly that there are applications that are going to that are going to benefit quite a bit from Monad's approach relative to maybe being on a layer two, and so so that's what really attracted us to it. And and they've just you know we were there in kind of the earliest days, and they've just executed tremendously. And we can't say I can't say you know anything but positive things about them. Yeah, they got a cool team here in New York. I actually went to that a little happy hour probably a month or two ago. They had a chance to go to their offices, and really a good squad over there. Another one you guys are, are yeah, working I'm on. Yeah, I'm surprised I didn't, didn't see you there. The reason I didn't see you there was I was traveling, but if I had been there, I would, I would have I would have come over and said hi. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I popped in for, I was there for about like an hour. I got a newborn, so my wife lets me out very short little sprints here. But the <laughs> other one that we wanted to chat on was was Parcel. We have a, a couple more we wanted just to touch on that we picked out that were really interesting to us. I know, Jody, I think you said you're actually a user of, of Parcel. So yeah, yeah. A, a specific really question there. But, yeah, uh, I was a real estate major, so like getting, it's almost like uh, having a REIT on chain of just playing different cities, and you know, it it, it kind of seems like I guess for you guys, like you're combining DeFi with some of that traditional finance, like knowledge of like, hey, like we think REITs will be popular. We think people want to bet on housing prices or commercial real estate in you know Miami, Florida, or you know San Francisco, et cetera. Uh, but also playing the downtrend, you know. Yeah. No. Listen, I talked a little bit before about you know. And that's zero to one innovation, right? And mm -hmm. so DeFi, you know, obviously, you know, more broadly is something that, that we believe is doing that, especially in the beginning. Parcel's a perfect example of that because it is DeFi, it is perps, right? But what's, what, if you, you know, kind of look under the hood, what is it really? It is a, an, a, a perp exchange, but that is, uh, allows you to do different types of financial products with a real time data set that is very unique to them specifically that didn't really exist before, right? And so if you think about, you know, uh, their ability to estimate and, I mean, do better than estimate, really approximate pricing and value on a block by block basis in different cities, like that is, that is insane. And that has not been something that has existed before. And the, their ability 
to execute on that vision has just been like absolutely tremendous. Love that business, love that, love that protocol, love the team. And what it also unlocks, by the way, not just speculation, right? You talked about that, but you know, for, for you know, people talk about like commodities, right? Commodity hedging has been something that has happened, you know, for since the beginning of, uh, yeah. of there being commodities financial products. Why shouldn't like a commercial real estate company want to hedge their exposure, right? You know, these are very long cycles of which they have to invest in and build out the, you know, the, the, the office buildings. And so locking in some gains or hedging, you know, you know, one city versus the next, depending on what, you know, kind of capital flows and people flows looks like, et cetera, like that type of financial primitive on, you know, kind of a, a new and unique and novel data set is just, it opens up a number of different use cases that is really like a, a zero to one type of innovation. That, that is fascinating. So do some of these big real estate firms, do they have access to the similar data? Is this the data is unique you're saying as well or the the spin on it with the yeah, so, blockchain? So, so I actually don't know what I can say and what I can't say. And so I will just tell you that I know for a fact, and you, got, you should talk to, to Trevor and the team, you, you should reach out to them, but they have proprietary data that is unique to them that mm-hmm. does not exist elsewhere. And that is well sought after by, or, or early should be by, you know, companies and, and, and that's where my right? mind went. I was like, this data is so valuable for the, before they start building massive projects and like these big corporations too, they all have their own real estate teams. So like before Chipotle is built, like they look at all these trends. So that's, that's extremely valuable. And I think with, as we yeah. see like in the news, the past like two to three years, you see things like San Francisco's dead or, you know, New York is dead during COVID. And it's good to have a more decentralized, like Oracle in a sense of saying like, look, like Here's like the data that we have aggregated that doesn't have personal opinion. It's not tied to like MSNBC or any kind of news source. It's like, no, like the market's you know kind of steady. And this is like what we're seeing, you know, traded on a daily basis. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, your point's kind of off topic, but not one of my portfolio companies. But if you look at the way people have been using Polymarket this year, right? Yeah. And just, you know, where Sam Altman's out, is he back in? Who knows? <laughs> like, you know, people are going there for, for like a source of truth, right? Because they believe that the market is at least a good indicator in so much as, you know, a separate data point, if not one of the most, you know, trustworthy data points, right? And I mean, I think mm-hmm. Donald Trump retweeted like a poly market stat, I don't know, a, a week ago or something, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, it's clearly becoming somewhat mainstream that people are thinking about, you know, these types of prediction markets and these types of kind of decentralized, trustless financial products to help us get a better understanding of what the market believes. It is cool to watch. I mean, we don't really realize it, but we're witnessing in, in real time kind of this massive shift. And I think we first saw it with crowdfunding was like, okay, wow, we can all kind of contribute a little bit to this. And that that helped the shift. And you see these pockets now and, and it's becoming mainstream, obviously, with the ETF news popping up. Now, has that shifted the narrative at all for VCs with the spot Bitcoin ETFs going through? You know, it, pro- it probably has with some of the tourist VCs. And, you know, not to, to denigrate anybody, but, you know, we see it every cycle, right? Like people mm-hmm. enter they because they, they see the ability to make money, then they exit, their LPs put certain types of pressure on them, et cetera. I don't think it has changed the mindset of a dragonfly or, you know, my peers who are, you know, really crypto natives. What I do think, which cannot be understated, is that it has provided a sense of, and just kind of a stamp of approval as we all believe this is a legitimate access class a lot of people have for a long time. But that legitimacy helps in those conversations with, you know, institutional allocators. It helps in those conversations with, yeah, even my grandmother when I go home, right? Mm. So like the, the, that type of legitimacy is going to continue to help and put tailwinds behind the whole industry and behind, you know, the the asset management, you know, industry within crypto. But I don't think it's changed, you know, my perspective on where the market's going in any way. Could you touch on uh, Medallion a little bit? That was another really interesting project that, that you guys are involved with within the music industry. Yeah, Medallion's great. And so we, we led their Series A. We announced that at last month. And I would say anyone who's been involved in the music industry understands like just how messed up the value capture is within in, in the industry and how the power dynamic is just, it's really disaggregated. And, you know, the artists themselves have like very, very little power. And so what Medallion does that's two things. One, it helps solve a problem for the industry, but two, it helps you know, solve a problem for the artists themselves. What it really does is it provides a platform. And this platform is a place where the artists can either spin up their own kind of universe or their own you know, instance that says, hey, super fans, come here. 
Mm-hmm. We are going to create net new opportunities, net new ways to engage with us, right? So that's things like, you know, digital types of goods, meaning there's a physical element and a digital element. Things like pre-selling the passes for tickets, which has always been done through so like Ticketmaster. But now there's always been a piece that goes directly to the artist. Now the artist can go and reach their super fans directly. And maybe they can do so in an NFT format. You can abstract a lot of that away. And they can, you know, continue to follow that fan as they do things like scan in to different events, as they do things like buy a, you know, high fidelity, you know, piece of music off that platform directly to them, not having to go through, you know, a third party as they, you know, have this whole experience that is directly engaging with the artist and disaggregating uh, the likes of some of those middlemen. And that's really important for, if you look at the way music has, has kind of evolved, there are a lot of musicians that have become, you know, viral on TikTok, viral on YouTube, that have gotten these like really, really rabid followings through non traditional means. And they've had a really hard time like monetizing through those platforms. They've had a really hard time monetizing or getting the word out through, you know, having to go through maybe like the type of label that would want to assign them, et cetera. And so now these people are getting, these kind of like rabid super fans that are coming to them on different types of socials that are coming to them on different types of mediums. And they're, they're able to say, engage with me through this, you know, a software platform that utilizes the blockchain where I can then better sell to you products that are really, really important on net new revenue um, that you really want. And I can get a much bigger cut of that. Right. And so that allows for that, that group that's, you know, not the Taylor Swift of the world to really monetize in a way that didn't exist before. And I think that's really, that's really, really important. And, and you see this shift kind of in consumer behavior more regularly is, is the, the, you know, not just in music, but in kind of, you know, broadly in entertainment, the idea that like, where well, I'm going to be a generalist consumer of music anymore, that doesn't exist much. What we see now is that, you know, if you go look at the downloads on Spotify, some of the artists that have the most people selling out arenas and stadiums, et cetera, you know, not the Taylor Swift of the world, but some of these people can fill out, you know, they can get 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 people at every show and they're rabid and they want to spend a bunch of money, but they also might not have 10 million downloads on Spotify and they might not be able to monetize because of that. And, and this is happening across kind of all types of consumer behavior and in entertainment. But the other thing that it does, by the way, is in kind of on the same vein is uh, with super fans, uh, one of the labels told me confidentially that they estimate that four percent of their revenue in certain uh, revenue streams within music come from, or sorry, forty uh, percent of the revenue comes from four percent of fans, right? So think mm-hmm. about that for a sec. If you can segment those customers in a, such a way that you can give them what they want, charge them higher prices, your the revenue opportunity is significantly bigger than it is now. There was an article or a, a research report by Goldman which took a little bit more conservative view, but they believe that the super fan mindset is about three times, to- it's worth about three times in lifetime value versus the regular fan. Yet, when you go to Spotify today, when you go and buy a ticket today, when you go and buy merch today, et cetera, we're not able to do that customer segmentation in a way that's uh, particularly interesting. And so this platform allows for both you know traditional music venues to use it to segment customers, but also for you know this certain segment of artists to directly reach their fans. It's kind of like in your position, you know, as an investor in like guiding these companies, it's like they're, they're slaying different dragons, you know? So it's not like traditional yep. finance that you're trying to replace with D5. But like yesterday, Solana announced the Saga 2 phone and, you know, what they're either serendipitously or intentionally, you know, there was also the announcement of the Apple case against, or Epic's case against Apple, where I think Anatoly retweeted or said directly that a lot of the monopoly or, or the lawsuit that Epic had against the Apple App Store, a lot of the rep- repercussions from the previous ruling have been watered down and it's really not going to like work out in Epic's favor. And so this is what makes Solana continuing the saga phone even more important is that crypto as a whole and, and Solana ecosystem, you know, is able to like get around some of these gatekeepers. And like in the music industry, it's record labels, it's you know, different distribution channels that take such a large you know, amount of value capture. And so it's interesting, yeah, like have a platform and you have different battles you're fighting now. You're fighting against the people in the industry and the, the producers and the labels. But it, it's cool to see crypto take on something other than just Gary Gensler and, you know, the top five banks. 
Well, and, and you know what's interesting, and we don't need to harp on music forever, but it's interesting, is that the, I mean, what the labels really care about is they care about, you know, getting a cut of, you know, revenue, right? Uh, but now, through whatever avenue that is, right? So if they can utilize Medallion to do better customer segmentation, but get a cut of it with the artists that didn't go to Medallion directly, still great for them. And then if the artists say, okay, well, like this is something that I can do separately from my my label who might have, you know, all the ticket sales and the merch or whatever, you know, the label might not like that. But what what they've what they've now able to do is they're able to build that into their holistic offering in a way that, you know, adds more revenue to them. So over time, I actually think Medallion is a win-win. So everybody, of course, they're taking some of that revenue for, you know, that that certain tier, but like it, you know, they're also getting better customer segmentation on the people that they're bringing to the platform. So I, I think it's it's they're not necessarily diametrically opposed, but I, I I will say to your point, like you know a big core ethos of, of crypto is you know trying to coordinate trust in a way without needing that middleman, right? Mm -hmm. Is that is that where you see NFTs? You know, I guess they've been around, they've kind of had their ups and downs. How, how, how do you see those in general? I mean, is it artists that makes sense? I went to NFT Week, got a free beer, went into like these free concerts, and I was like, oh okay, this is this is cool. It's a virtual ticket, effectively. That allows me membership into this club, you know, and so that makes sense from an artist perspective. Obviously, we've been in the space. Jody and I have talked to like real estate companies, and it can go really anywhere. But would be curious just to kind of wrap it up and how you see NFTs evolving in the next few years. Yeah, I mean, I think that's let's take a core use case, right? So the, you know, PFPs have their place, and Feblin goods have their place. You know, more broadly, people like to you know flex on others. They like to be able to <laughs> express their identity, right? But I, I don't think that is, you know, the core use case of, you know, non-fungible tokens over time. I do believe if you look at, you know, everything that's happening in the world of of like corporates experimenting with like web three types of initiatives, NFTs have a large place in that. And in, in a lot of cases, it's things for like membership clubs, it's like loyalty, it's you know, point systems, et cetera. And I and I think it is also like, you know, digital and physical representations of things, digital goods. We saw some, you know, a lot of corporates like you know, drop like, you know, I don't know, Porsche dropped like, you know, these like N the NFTs that were like, you know, kind of, you know, I don't think had a great reaction by the market because there wasn't much to do with it. Right. But now what we're starting to see is like the corporates are saying, this is interesting, but I have to figure out with my marketing team and, and like how best to engender loyalty, how best to engender not that initial interaction, but, you know, the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. Mm. And I think you can go so far as to to look at what I think it went a little bit under the radar, but Visa launched a, like a Web three wallet initiative, I I don't know, like like a week or two ago. Yeah, and and it's really around being able to do loyalty across different platforms, different you know different corporates, but in a way that you know incentivizes people for action, incentivizes people for engagement, and doesn't just incentivize people for you know spending money. Right. And loyalty more broadly is just it's broken. Right. And people have been trying to fix this for a long time. Companies have been trying to fix this for a long time. Uh, but it's too fragmented. There's too many different ways of which people, you know, acts of loyalty, different applications, et cetera. And it's too focused on just financial incentives and not building community and building engagement. Right. And I think NFTs and the ways in which they can be used actually really empowers that. And I, I mean, we see it with basically every major corporate experimenting in that. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's going to be cool to see all the cross pollination. I just see like a world in which Nike, you get the shoe, then you get the NFT of the shoe and you get to see Kendrick Lamar perform in New York, you know, or something like that. So th there's a right. lot of just cross pollination I can see between brands leveraging the NFTs. My kind of like curiosity is around just on the regulation side, you know, we went through this period in like 2023 and a little bit before that, but really a lot of US regulation pushing companies out, you know, Coinbase, you know, talking around like what they're doing internationally and like alternative headquarters and, you know, rolling out different products, you know, like exchanges and like Caymans and, and, you know, what we've seen in the past like two weeks is that, you know, some of that fear has kind of like subsided. I think there's a lot of like excitement, you know, because of that ETF approval kind of gives, you know, maybe a harder case for the SEC to sue everyone, you know, if, if they suddenly approved certain ETFs, like they can, they're still going to crack down from a regulatory perspective. But, you know, where do you see, you know, the U.S. going? Because you have so much, you know, exposure internationally. You see companies or you see like countries like Singapore, you know, making, you know, logical, you know, progress in a very like methodical way. Um, 
do you still see the U.S. as being far behind or do you see us, you know, now the now we've kind of gotten over the hump of the ETF that you think we'll get a little more momentum on the downswing? Yeah, I, I still listen. I, you know, people have lost a lot of money on, on trying to speculate and I've stopped trying to speculate on, you know, what Gary Gensler is going to do and what the SEC is going to do. I think uh, my read of, of just kind of human behavior is that, you know, things aren't just going to change because they lost this case relative to the ETF. And if you look at the, you know, kind of the announcement that Gary Gensler put out in regard to the Bitcoin ETF, well, you know, he's basically says, Hey, listen, while, you know, we're approving this ETF, we, you know, want to remind you that we believe Bitcoin is basically only used for money laundering, right? Which was an extraordinarily unprofessional, never seen anything like it in my time on Wall Street, but, you know, they did it anyways. And so it's clear that there's like still animus, right? Mm-hmm. Towards the, sp- yeah. towards the space in, the, in the US. So I, I don't know if I believe that like, you know, DAOs or, you know, protocols should be building and launching st- tokens in the US without regard to very, very specific, you know, types of regulatory or legal structures that need to be very thoughtful around that. I do believe over time, the US is going to become more friendly because they have to. It is, you don't want to push innovation offshore. You don't want there to be a situation in which all of this, the new financial system is happening in Asia, right? Like that is something that is, you know, against the core mandate of what these, you know, regulatory agencies want to do in, in, in the US. And so I, I think, you know, when we invest, we have a, what we think about, like, what do, what do we believe is doable in the US? What do we believe is doable in Europe? What do we believe is doable in Asia? And we encourage people to be thoughtful around what they do in those different jurisdictions. And we have that global outlook. So there are certain things which, you know, theoretically, I would probably not invest in the US-based team doing, but I could theoretically invest in the Asia-based team doing. But I do think over time, you know, that the use of crypto, the use of DAOs, the use of, you know, governance tokens, et cetera, I, I do believe over time that those are going to become more acceptable in the US. And, and I don't believe that, you know, we have to avoid the US when we invest because of the current regime that, you know, may or may not still be here in the year. Mm. What do you think about the, we have an election year coming up, you know, the, they talked about lowering some of these rates, like broadly speaking, do you think over the next few months, we'd just love to your take on kind of like where we're heading from an economy. And obviously the, we're, we're starting to see some correlation previously to, to the markets, obviously in Bitcoin. So just kind of curious what you're, if you're able to make like some short term and, and longer term predictions at all to kind of wrap this up. Yeah. So listen, I'm, I'm really data driven and I've always, I invest that way. I think I try to structure my thought process that way. And to the point about rate cuts, I don't know anything that the market doesn't know. And I don't know anything that you know, I'm not told by the dot plot. And the market is telling me that they expect, you know, four to five, you know, 25 bit rate cuts this year, right? Dot plot, I think, is on four, if I'm remembering correctly. And so it feels like, yeah, we'll probably get the, those those rate cuts. I think if you look at, you know, the recent macroeconomic data, it's mostly GDP. I think GDP now actually just got moved up again to 2.4% for this quarter from 2.1%. We just had a very strong year from a GDP perspective in the US. Um, inflation continues to stagnate. And the it does feel, and I've been ringing the soft landing drum for a long time, and who knows if I'll actually be right, but you know, I, 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 when the market you know bottomed in, I think October of 22 or November of 22, I was saying that the data didn't suggest that we, that we were going to have this kind of massive recession. Mm-hmm. And, and so I believe that you know, they were so going to have a strong year economically and that we are going to get those rate cuts because that's what the market is telling me. And that's what the data is telling me. And so what is that? That's bullish for risk asset, right? And that mm-hmm. includes crypto and it's a bullish for, and that includes venture more broadly. It's, 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 and so, you know, I'm excited. I'm ca- or cautiously optimistic. I think there are certain areas in which it doesn't really matter if, you know, we, we necessarily get rate cuts or not. Because mm-hmm. product market fit is there and it's growing. Like one of those areas is, is, is stable coin innovation and payments, right? There, mm-hmm. last I looked and I might have outdated numbers now, but there were over something like over $45 billion of USDT on Tron. And that USDT mm-hmm. on Tron is mostly being directly exchanged and peer to peer, right? Like the ERB. We heard Argentina I mean, the, past, be- the past two weeks, we've heard Tron like pop up like 10 times now. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's obviously being used, in, and I said mostly used for peer to peer. It's obviously being probably primarily used for trading, but 
but it's being used in significantly in places like Argentina, places like Turkey, places like Southeast Asia for payments. It's mm-hmm. being used for you know peer to peer transactions. It's being used for you know B two C transactions. And, and when you look at, I think you know Nick Carter had a good slide that Morgan Stanley reproduced. That was basically if you look at all the stablecoin transactions over the last year, it's already above what the Visa network is doing, mm-hmm. right? And so I think what is obvious is that things like payments are going to do and stable coins are going to continue to be disrupted regardless of what happens to some of the more risky assets. I think to the, what we just talked about in the loyalty and the fidgetal side, I think that's coming this year regardless, no matter what happens. And I think we're going to consider you see the maturation of scaling solutions, ZK tech, which will bring you know more and more applications that I probably even thought of today. Right. Mm-hmm. And that are going to be, you know, this is such a fast moving industry, such a, it innovates so quickly that I, I, I'm sure I don't even know what will be super exciting to me in six months. Yeah. No, it's, it's wild. And I'm always just curious too. And I know we got to wrap it up, but you know, there's so many distractions like with the Houthis right now and the Red Sea. I was just listening to the all in podcast sure. and they were talking about that and the effect on oil. And, you know, that obviously affects manufacturing, which everything kind of trickles down from there, you know, so. It will be an, an exciting year, but it always is. I always There's always something going on, right, to distract. And you really just kind of got to look at the, the data and see what happens. And I think like, I mean, quick on that, it's just you, you hope people start to learn, and especially like you coming from a data-driven thought process is like U.S. president doesn't matter that much in a lot of sense of the Great. stock market. Like, you know, the president before was at the end of a long bull cycle, you know, like Ray Dalio is big on talking around just like these big macro cycles. And then the president now, like, didn't necessarily pull us out of inflation or like tamp down inflation. It's largely driven by liquidity in the Fed and the actions, you know, of like the treasury itself. And so like the the next president's probably not going to matter as much. It's going to be more on like, is liquidity coming back or or rates getting cut? Does does the payment landscape shift and and this crypto get adopted and normalized? No doubt. It'll be interesting because I I just saw Vivek and Trump together on stage and he he was pretty pro-crypto. And so... It could be positive for the industry if we do have a change, but we'll see. Yeah, l- listen, I think I think the the regulatory headwinds are real, and so I, I completely agree with the point that people overestimate like w- what the w- what the president can do. But you know, the regulatory bureaucracies they can scare people. They can you know put a uh, claim down on innovation, and so I do believe that matters to what is happening at least you know in the U.S. and in, and and you know the EU, et cetera. But I also agree that, you know, if we're just thinking about prices and Bitcoin ETH go up, like all that other stuff matters a lot more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, uh, Rob, it was such a pleasure having you on, on the show today. Definitely would love to stay in touch. You mentioned some of the companies that you work with, so it might be pinging you for an intro to some of those guys to bring them on the show too. But really appreciate our awesome. time today and looking forward to seeing what you guys do. Great to check us. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks, Rob.